Siata and John Mills from WPP. Welcome to the stage. foundation for future corporate growth and we're going to be talking about how large corporations and brands innovate and grow taking advantage of cultural shifts and emerging innovation and technology so um, why don't you guys introduce yourselves you'll do a much better job with your names than I will sure uh, my, my name is fairly easy I'm John I'm from London been out in Asia for six years now I look after um, corporate development for WPP in Asia, and also help our agencies uh, work better together on digital. Okay. Hi, I'm uh, Thomas. Uh, I'm with AXA, so I've been in Singapore for a year and a half, roughly, right now. Uh, before, I was uh, entrepreneur slash consultant, and then, in the end, I ended up on the, on the insurance side uh, and financial services, uh, and this has been my journey for uh, last almost five years. Okay. Uh, so, hi everyone. My name is Manik. I'm the CIO for SAP Asia Pacific and Japan. I look after IT internally. Um, yeah, I'm happy to join this panel. And Kashif? Good afternoon. Uh, my name is uh, Kashif. I'm from Agziara Digital Services. I look after the technology and innovation across our uh, portfolio of uh, companies. Um, before that, um, I've been in the region for about five years. And before that, I was in the U.S. working for a large uh, cable operator. And before that, I was in consulting. So. Mm. so the first question I wanted to ask is, how is the shift in, has there been some kind of shift in how large corporations and multinationals need to think about growth today that wasn't an issue before? So what? Um, okay, so... I'll ask a question and you guys get to answer. Okay. <laughs> Let me start. Uh, so I think that what you can see right now in uh, what's happening, and it's uh, mostly driven by the fact that we are in the age of digital economy, and you need to, you need to look differently at your customer, as your competitor, uh, and all the different uh, facets. And one of the key areas how to grow is through partnerships. And uh, uh, you can see this how important it's becoming the trend and uh, lever for growth. Uh, even in the organization corporate structures, the fact that uh, right now it's quite uh, common to have chief partnership officer, head of partnerships, gives you the, uh, an idea and uh, indication how important it is uh, to grow through the partnerships. And that sometimes the partnerships are uh, not only especially in the insurance uh, industry, uh, if you look back historically, uh, most of the partnerships were institutional partnerships. We're partnering with banks, with another uh, other big institution to distribute our product. Right now, we can see clear shift into the affinity type of the partnerships, even with um, uh, industries that are completely, they don't have anything to do with the, uh, at the uh, first side, uh, with uh, the core business of, of insurance. But as well, what you see, is that you look different at the competitors. Competitors are different, but as well your core competitors, uh, sometimes you are becoming partners, and you see the collaborations in terms of, uh, in terms of uh, working on the, uh, on the solutions, but as well as making sure that uh, technological solutions like a, uh, fintech, uh, fintech consortiums, like FreeBI working on the blockchain, uh, where all the uh, companies from the, uh, in, from the ecosystem, starting from insurers, brokers, as well as reinsurers, are working together to shape the future. So the partnership definitely is the, the way to grow, especially in a market like Singapore, which is small, saturated, mm -hmm. and partnership is, is one of the ways to, to go, go ahead to make a difference. Anyone so, else want to? So maybe, maybe I want to add a different flavor to what Thomas said. So. Um, as a tech company, and I think what we've seen this also in multiple industries, is that really the only way for any company to grow is to grow your innovation portfolio. And this is really the primary driver, what we've seen is that you know, drives growth. Now, how you build that innovation portfolio could be different. So 
you know, obviously one way is to, you know, do the innovation internally, so that, you, that means you have your own teams developing your products and all, but you could also acquire innovation. So you could buy new companies, you could, you know, have acquisitions. And then, of course, the third way would be also to have these partnerships on how you grow your innovation portfolio. But at least in our organization, what we've seen is that all the growth that we've seen in the last seven to eight years has been a combination of all these factors. But if you really want to take one topic at a headline level, um, it's really to look at the innovation portfolio that you have and how do you grow that innovation portfolio uh, from a company. And that fundamentally drives growth. From a client point of view, like the customers we are serving, right? they are looking at what new things we can offer to them. And this is why that innovation portfolio, the depth of that portfolio really matters. And, and this is why uh, companies who want to continue to do business with us, they are looking at you know, what's new in the market and what, what are we offering out there. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think the good comments are made already. I would probably just add that um, you know, the, the traditional methods still apply where uh, you are in a market and you want to grow the market beyond your, beyond your footprint. And the technologies today basically allow easier access to go to markets that are that, that are not necessarily in, in you, you, in, in physically in, in your in your footprint. So certainly, from our platforms and and technologies and ecosystem of partners that you can develop are are, are completely um, you know re getting redefined, so to speak, because traditional partners or channels are are being sort of uh, replaced by digital partners and channels. And so as a result, the businesses are able to sort of expand their footprint much more rapidly across, across a region or across regions. Um, I mean, from a, from a traditional perspective, you know, that was, has always been the, the strategy to grow, you know, if it's an organic. But as, uh, as pointed out that, you know, we can also uh, acquire companies, uh, acquire capabilities, um, and also look for our core business and see what are the adjacent business that we can sort of look to acquire as well to grow um, our footprint or our, our capabilities and be able to sort of defend uh, our turf. John? Yeah, I, I think there's always been um, this kind of tension between the corporate world and the startup world. And has it changed? Yeah, certainly it's a lot easier now for a startup to launch and out of their, their bedroom and become global within a couple of weeks and that but that potential for startups has always been there I guess the way now for corporates is to make sure they can work with these companies that can create interesting ideas very quickly and bring them into their ecosystem and that's that's the challenge for uh, and with WP we have 200,000 people around the world but we at the same time we try to be innovative and the, the way we do that is through various things acquisitions is a big part of it but the main part of it is helping our people internally innovate and encourage them to do that. Yeah, it seems that corporations have to um, be more nimble and um, quicker to act than they've been in the past in order to keep pace with how fast startups can move. Is that, is that sort of the landscape? Yeah, definitely. I think it, it's a lot easier if you're a startup with, with 10 guys to pivot I've heard that word pivot so many times over the last couple of days to pivot your business model and change compared to a public company that has to check in with annual reports every year and report their earnings and has to worry about the share price every day for sure. So I think it's about combining those two mentalities, I suppose. Can you guys each talk about um, particular challenges that you've had in growing your companies or your particular divisions um, and how you realize that, how you were able to hurdle those challenges um, either through engaging customer experience, um, partnerships, certain types of uh, technology automation, that sort of thing. So who would like to jump into that first? All right. So maybe I'll take a shot at this one. So I think one of the things that we've done within our technology department per se or the IT uh, mm -hmm. department per se is to take a look at you know, how the startup community runs. And exactly to John's point, right, you know, the startup, syst uh, the, the whole ecosystem, uh, one of the key uh, success factors is their ability to pivot based on changes and things that they see. Now, what we try to do within our own department is to try to bring in some of these cultural behaviors into what is traditionally a very slow-moving process. So, for example, a project might have taken in the past a year to execute. Uh, now we are trying out different ways how we can execute projects within a week, within two weeks, and get smaller results, but finite, you know, really tangible outcomes, and then 
you know, based on those outcomes, make the next decision and move on. So we, we are trying to learn, if you may, from the startup world. At the same time, exactly to your point, as a company with uh, a fair amount of legacy in place, um, and, and some of the, it's not really legacy in a negative way, but it's some of it which is required to protect the uh, company uh, because you have customer bases that's been there for you know, decades and so on and so forth. You have to kind of um, you know, take care of that as well. Um, so you're not as nimble as sometimes you could be, but at the same time, you try to learn from the startup world and this community in terms of you know, what are the, some of the behaviors you can bring in and change the culture of the company and change the behaviors of you know, how you do things within an organization. That's one very good impact that I'm seeing. And actually, one of the reasons that I was here this afternoon was to also learn from the, the different startups that are outside, um, try to understand from them what are the new ideas that they have, and see if we can collaborate with some of these startups to bring in these new com ideas into the company, into some of our projects as well. OK. And, um, and Tom, you're going to jump in, too. Yeah. Uh, so I have one comment that actually resonates quite well with uh, what you just mentioned. That example of the, uh, of the challenge uh, is traditionally, insurance is a service company. And one of the challenges that we are facing, and uh, I think we are happily at the end of the, the cycle, is how we change the perception of the technology. Because right now, the technology is becoming uh, how you create a value, how you actually create the value as a business for the customer as well as internally. But as well, technology uh, will define your investment in the technology and technological uh, decisions will define in which industry you will be in the future. To give you an example, I think two years ago, the CEO of uh, BBVA, which is one of the, uh, the biggest uh, uh, Spanish banks that have operation in the US as well, said that in a couple of years, we will become a technology company. We will not be a, a service provider or financial institution. So educate uh, not only the uh, in educate internal uh, stakeholders that technology needs to be the core of your business strategy and how that actually technology is uh, uh, creating the value and creates the uh, differentiator for you and the, uh, on, the, on the market. So this was one of the, uh, one of the challenges. Of course, uh, if you want to really embrace uh, this part uh, of the technology, it has to follow up with agile, uh, lean practices, because only then you can actually reap the real benefits and, uh, and be nimble and effective in using it. Otherwise, it's, I would say it's putting uh, like a lipstick on a, on a pig. Uh, it's just very superficial and, and will fail uh, uh, like any other IT project. It'll be called, uh, everyone gonna excuse you because uh, it's another IT project, so let's don't, uh, uh, let's don't care about this. So basically, don't, be, don't let the technology overpower your relationship with your customers. Make, no. Make sure that you are still in touch with the customers, even if you're automating. So it's not about automation. Technology creates a new way to engage the customer. Okay. And this is a value creator. And having the right foundation in the platforms allows you to create new value and how you engage with the customer, how you interact, how you run your business, how you even partner. Things like uh, having APIs. We were mentioning before the partnership that it's a new way of growth. If you don't have the right infrastructure for the APIs, it's very difficult to experiment and, uh, and work with the, the ecosystem. And those are one of the key enablers that uh, give you the, the edge uh, and ability to really create the market, not forgetting about the customer, because in the end, customer experience is, is the ultimate goal that you want to deliver, and this is the ultimate value that you want to create. Okay. Let me, let me, uh, let me um Tell you the Axiata story because I think it's interesting and relevant to what uh, also you were asking. Uh, so Axiata um, has a core business of Telco, right, which is the mobile services provider. We have about 290 million customers across the region. And um, everybody knows the telecom business is not, uh, the margins are going down, the SMS and, and voice are getting uh, at low usage. And um, the growth from within the core is, is difficult to get. Um, so four years ago, we, we, we knew that was coming. And we said we need to basically diversify our portfolio beyond what we're doing in the core. But at the same time, we, you know, core is a tremendous asset. And we have to leverage that core as well. And so we uh, were brave enough to go into businesses that we were, were, were alien to telco. So 
So we invested in uh, uh, advertising business. We we invested in uh, digital content business. We we invested in uh, mobile financial services, um, and then we also built platforms that uh, connected those new businesses or the digital channels with our core telco assets using the same technologies that are uh, like APIs and and so it it, it made um, access to different channels uh, easier for our core platform and as a result we were able to um, provide more value to our core services but in, in addition we we're able to uh, create new value uh, through uh, uh, sort of uh, other businesses that uh, business lines that we are sort of digital in nature not telco in its core so we were uh, the, the lesson learned from that and, and then today we are the largest social marketing company across the ASEAN um, and uh, we have um, what we call the largest exchange that connects all the telco platforms together with the digital world and and so you know there's a good there's a good story to tell uh, from that perspective but the thing is we we knew what our core was and what are our strengths. And then we knew we were brave enough to go into areas that were totally foreign to us. But then, you know, we, we, we tied them together so that, you know, the, the, the core innovates on its own and it also leverages the investments from the uh, other capabilities or other businesses in a complementary fashion. I just wanted to riff a little bit off something that you said, which is, it, it, um, I've seen corporations start to invest in revenue streams or businesses that might even be disruptive to their core business, but it's a way of staying ahead of the curve. So for example, someone once said to me that the reason Kodak went out of business is because they didn't invest in the digital camera. They thought of themselves as a film company and they saw digital as disruptive and what they should have thought of as they were in the recording memories business, not the film business. And had they invested into, into this, in this seemingly disruptive technology, they would have kind of grown and morphed into this other type of, of business and, and stayed current and with the times. And that sounds a little bit like yeah, what you're and, doing. Yeah, that's a very good point. It's because exa that's exactly what we're doing in some markets. Uh, so, so, so I think the, uh, we call ourselves disruptors internally because we want to disrupt our own business in a way that um, we can learn from and then pivot and then uh, provide that learning back to the core so that they can be better prepared for handling that dis disruption. Mm -hmm. So absolutely part of the innovation is anticipate, uh, knowing, the, knowing the barriers and then seeing how somebody can lower those barriers uh, and disrupt your business. And, and, and try to do it more proactively yourself that makes sense to the business. So the interesting thing in that story uh, is that Kodak invented the digital camera. Um, so I don't know if, you, if everyone's aware of it. Oh yeah, that they did. So they Kodak did. invented the digital camera and, the, and the, the person who invented it was given a couple of years to kind of you know, you know, commercialize it and, and make it into a product. And actually a couple of years when he made it into a product, the board and product actually killed the product because they thought that this would actually uh, uh, be taking away business from the existing film business and so on and so forth. And then the rest is history. I mean, everybody knows what happened. So, uh, to, you know, to your point, I think it's not just, uh, you know, sufficient to, you know, be able to create that first, you know, uh, the spark of innovation, but to have a mechanism after that to kind of be bold enough to make decisions to disrupt yourself at the risk of existing business that might be affected for now for the future growth of the company. And this is, this is extremely important to recognize. And I think there's very few companies which are able to make those bold decisions. Um, because when it comes, I always look at it at this point, uh, from, from this point, at some point, you're going to have a conflict internally to your company. You're going to have a conflict between the existing business groups mm -hmm. and the new business that is, you know, being, you know, pushed with this new innovation that's coming through. And you need a very strong leader in that point of time to make those bold decisions to, to decide, you know, how to go forward as a company. And it's not easy. Right, right. Um, John, I don't want you to feel left out. No, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> well, just, I was thinking of a more positive um, case. Your, your Kodak example is very sad of a great brand going out of business because it didn't follow. But then, 
if you think about someone like Domino's, the pizza company, which was in the doldrums, was just a boring, boring pizza company that's transformed itself into a very much technology-led business through investing in different ways in the platforms that people allow them to reach and get pizza. And it's incredible. You see the share price. It was basically a company that was going bust and is now doing fantastically well because they're willing to take that risk and, and make bets on technology. Okay. And I think that the key element here is the culture, to exactly to, to your point, that uh, you need to be, have guts to take those decisions and uh, encourage, because I think that right now, most of the people, especially at the executive level, have been hearing the stories of Kodaks, uh, of, um, uh, uh, of uh, Netflix, uh, and so on, for many years now. So I think that the awareness is there. The question is, are we bold enough? And, is it in the culture uh, of the company to take the uh, take the uh, that kind of the decision? But I, I think that we are lucky enough in uh, in AXA that uh, the management, especially top management, has the, this awareness, which is actually quite uh, to take risk, which is quite funny because insurance is all protecting against risk. So we are lucky enough to not to be closed into this, uh, uh, not to be. Uh, risk uh, others and uh, believe in uh, uh, taking bold decisions and uh, that effect, uh, eventually can cannibalize your, your business. Then there's a question, which type of the execution is good? And if you read uh, Innovator's uh, Dilemma yeah. the yeah. book, there are different examples uh, what happened across the years, especially in the semiconductor uh, uh, industry. And there are different models to do it. Internalize, externalize, partner up, uh, M&As. Uh, only time can prove what, what is the most effective uh, way, but it's important to learn on the mistakes and errors or, of others because uh, it's very stupid to, to repeat the errors. So that's, uh, that's, that's I think, the, in the end, that's the bottom line. Yeah. Um, John, you had mentioned that you wanted to talk about mergers and acquisitions and partnerships. Um, as a means to your company's growth, and Manic talked about IT partnerships. Um, what other kinds did your company engage in to grow? Sure. So, uh, WP at its heart is a is a people based business, um, and our clients have a multitude of different challenges all around the world. That the issue for us and where our growth comes from uh, and our acquisition strategy is focused primarily on two things. It would be um, moving into new markets. Uh, which is why I moved out here six years ago to focus on that, um, and on new technologies, which I guess is the focus of this whole whole event. Um, so that that's really our strategy, and the, the way we do that is a few different ways. Um, firstly, it would be through acquisitions. So we we have a pretty aggressive um, strategy of buying successful um, owner-managed businesses around the world. And there's a couple of guys in this room I just saw of a company we bought a few years ago, which has done fantastically well. And then we we also look at investments in um, technology platforms, content companies, e-commerce type businesses. Um, so we're, we're very active in that space and we work very closely with, um, in the entrepreneurial world with private equity companies to make sure we're seeing the best of the best, of the best around the world. Um, for me, the, the most important thing is to make sure your company is open to exploring, as Thomas said, these, these things. It's like you're flying a big plane that you can't afford to let it go down. You have to keep it flying whilst bringing in new things and that's, that's the challenge. There was a question I just thought of based on what you were saying. Um, I know that a lot of people at this conference have their own startups, and your companies are often looking for startups that they can buy out or, or incorporate or acquire into the company. Is there a particular thing that you look for in startups that you, or smaller companies that you acquire? Are there certain traits, or is it basically how successful they are and um, how, what kind of a niche they fill? Um, uh, I guess if, we, if there was an easy answer to that, we would all be, be billionaires and, <laughs> and have, have the, the secret sauce. But for me, it's particularly in our industry, it's very much about the people. Uh -huh. and having a great idea is fantastic, but if you don't have the right team and the people around it to be able to change, and and go with the ups and downs, then it, you're always going to struggle. So we look for the strong, strong leaders, I would okay. say. Okay. And so, would you guys so, all so go with that? For, 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 for us, Axera Digital, we, we only do series A and above. <clears throat> and typically what we're looking uh, for is a company that has a successful business model 
that is demonstrated in other parts of the world, and then we just give them a platform and a footprint for in Asia to grow. So mm -hmm. it has worked uh, reasonably well for us uh, from that perspective, and it has given us a head start in, 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 in grabbing the market share, so to speak. Um, and so, I mean, in, in, in doing that, obviously, we have defined, defined verticals, as I mentioned before. If it's a digital content company, for example, we acquired uh, Yonder uh, from US and then tied their service of music streaming to our uh, you know, operators' uh, customers. And as a result, we were able to reduce the churn for the operators because it's a very sticky service once you have uh, music. Uh, and, and then also on the uh, ADS side, because we gave them access to you know, a few hundred a million uh, customers, which can, they can sort of go after. The valuation of the company uh, on that side is, 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 you know, is, is, is on the upside. And so as we, and that's our strategy, sort of how can we leverage the core and, and the digital world and then get the best of both worlds? Yeah. So, so we have different strategies for different kinds of companies. So it's not like one size fits all. Um, so there is obviously an acquisition strategy that we follow to fill white spaces in our portfolio. So that's uh, generally uh, we have a large portfolio as a SAP as a company, but there are always white spaces, new topics that are coming up which would complement our portfolio, and then these are acquisitions targets, so to speak. But we do a lot with startups as partnerships as well. So what this means is that. Um, we, for example, could go to a startup and say that, why don't we jointly build a product um, that's based on what you guys already have on our platform, and then when you all are selling your product, we can sell our platform as well, so we mm -hmm. both make money out of it. Um, then a lot of startups, one of the biggest issues of startups is, to your point, accessing a customer base. Um, as a large company, having uh, 330,000 customers globally, we can give them access to that base of customers, which a lot of people are looking forward to, and it kind of gets to a win-win situation. So it, it's never a one-size-fits-all. Um, it really depends on the kind of um, you know, startup or they're doing, which kind of market they're addressing, and, and we really look at these as opportunities. Um, generally, we always try to go for a win-win situation, and, and in some cases, this is always uh, you know, better. Sometimes the, a partnership is a better strategy than an acquisition. In, uh, you know, it helps both companies. Should market, oh, I'm sorry. Were you about to say something? We, so go ahead. Just, just a short comment. So for us, it's, it's actually quite similar situation. AXA is the number one insurance company worldwide, and we not only work in the traditional insurance segment, but as well work in banking, or asset management. Mm -hmm. uh, so the number of gaps is very big because the scope and where we work is very big. But uh, we have as well different strategies, starting from partnering, investing in terms of having our own VC funds and uh, driving the investments in terms of acquisition, but as well as driving our own spin-offs uh, internally. But in order to partner or uh, do acquisition, what we look for is, is the execution and creation of the value because ideas are cheap. The execution is, is actually the thing that makes, uh, makes a difference. And if you are able to execute and improve, that's, uh, that's a very good example. And especially if, uh, in some cases, uh, uh, if you work with one of the companies in any other geography and the partnership is uh, successful, and that means our own uh, uh, subsidiaries in, the region, in any, any part of the world, it's always a good uh, uh, start of the longer relationship or uh, introduction to the merger uh, or acquisition uh, type of the uh, approach. And should revenue be the only, and market share, be the only indicators of growth, or are there other ways of looking at growth? For example, um, brand image, consumer awareness, social media engagement, improved product, corporate social responsibility. Are there ways of, of expanding your companies in, in, in ways that in the past might not have been considered growth, but today must be thought about? Uh, so I think... Uh, or, or is it still the bottom line? I, I think the bo uh, it's bottom line at, at some point in time. Uh, but for a traditional mature business, revenue is the, is the king. You know, they get killed by not meeting a quarterly target, right? 
So you, you cannot really go and get away from that uh, in, a, in the traditional mature business model. Now in the internet world where the, the revenue is, is, is slightly less important early on, but the, the focus is more on the, uh, you know, the size of the opportunity, so to speak, and building that uh, perception, um, and, uh, and then monetizing it over a period of time with, with, with add-ons. Um, that creates a completely different model for what we call value rather than growth. It's, it's really creating value but it's a, it's a different kind of value from, from a company perspective. Mm. But, it, but, it, but at some point in time, like is the case for Amazon, they finally turned into a profitable company last year, but it's been, they've, been, they've been around for a decade or more. Uh, so, so, so I think it uh, depends on what kind of business they are. Uh, if, uh, if they are in the internet business, um, then the value is, is, is perceived. Uh, over a longer period of time, and 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 it's built accordingly. So I think that in terms of uh, value, uh, I think most of us learned the lesson from 2008, where uh, the only measure of the value was the revenue, and very short term, short sighted uh, perception uh, and chasing the the revenue, which ended up in dire consequences for for global markets. So I think that's. Uh, Going out of this experience, uh, we, un we started to understand that value is created as well beyond monetary, uh, monetary, uh, monetary uh, KPIs, uh, and it's, uh, it's distributed across uh, different areas of the value chain, starting from. And I think, in the end, what is the most important is the customer satisfaction and what you deliver to the uh, to the customer. If you can create the value, this in the end will impact both your top line as well as bottom line. This is one of the, the core uh, core focuses for, for us: how to uh, impact the uh, create the value for the customers and move the relationship as the insurer from payer to partner. Because in a partnership, in the end, it's a win-win win-win uh, type of the relationship. Both of the parties needs to. Uh, uh, Get the benefit out of it. So improving a reputation is a kind of growth, and of and has to be thought of as such. Yeah. Maybe maybe okay. I can give a different spin to this. So I think if if you talk about like pure growth, then it's usually tied to uh, what the capital markets or the stakeholders want out of the company, which is usually um, you know top line growth or you know uh, growth in terms of your market cap and so on and so forth, right? Which is normally driven by the numbers, right? But I think you know the other spin to it, which I think is also becoming extremely important, is like how does the company define success? Um, and success is not always defined by the top line. And this is exactly the point where I would say that we have other KPIs, uh, to your point, which have started becoming a lot more important. For example, you know, how is your company doing when it comes to sustainability? You know, what is your company doing around CSR? Um, you know, what is your employee satisfaction or employee engagement index within your company? What is your customer satisfaction score? Um, these are all contributors to your success, which are, uh, you know, which give a lot of uh, indication in terms of how your future growth might look like uh, from a you know from a company point of view, and I think um, you know if you look at like some of the to your point some of these uh, so-called tech companies, their valuations are very high. It's because they can uh, put a lot of these non-monetized uh, you know indicators out there for people to look at and see that what is the potential of this company in the next five to ten years. And actually, if you look at, for example, I mean, you can take an example of Amazon or Google or Alphabet or these kind of companies. If you look at the innovation index that these companies are driving, one of the reasons the valuations are so high is because the innovation index is very high on these companies, which kind of shows or gives confidence to the capital markets that the possibility of success if you invest in these companies is going to be high going forward. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's, if you're looking at top line today or like, you know, market cap today, for sure, you have to show some success in some areas and the measurable one is revenue. But if you look at like how sustainable a company can be in the future, like will it be in business even in the next five years, there's a lot of other indicators to look at. Maybe it goes back to your point, like what do you look for if you are investing in a company? You look at the people, you look at the execution. And these are indicators of the people and execution that defines the, let's say, a high chance of success going forward. Like and for you example, mentioned, oh, for go example, ahead. For example, like just to add to it, um, I, mean, I, I think the, in, in today's world, uh, if you try to uh, take the um, a, a customer experience 
uh, side of the, uh, as well as the, you know, uh, engagement side. Um, you know, how relevant you are to the customer, how engaged the customer is with you, and how you are engaged with the customer. I think that's, that's like, yeah. if, you, if you want to boil it down is, are you relevant and are you engaged with your customer and the, your customer is engaged with you. If you are able to do that in a positive fashion and, and build upon it, then, you know, that's a, that's, a, uh, that, that's a recipe for success in retaining them as well as being able to add new uh, products or services to, to them, whether it's in the internet model, or whether it's in the traditional model. So I think customer engagement is tied with customer experience, all the technologies around it, it's really, it's really defining how, how people will buy services. And the good example for this is actually an example of Snapchat, because Snapchat is a messaging platform. Everyone is, in theory, it's very easy to migrate, but the whole generation created an emotional connection. And because they are engaged and they have a connection with the, with the service. So that's why they, uh, they, during the IPO, they managed to get such a high, uh, uh, evaluation because beyond yeah, this yeah. there is no I mean, chat, chat platform yeah. is a great example yeah. because you know uh, whatsapps or line or yeah. uh, you know are, are a great example where people are using the platform for free but now through that businesses can tap that engagement which in a way they were not able to tap before for example banks don't have a chat platform where customers are engaged you know you have to physically go and, uh, uh, and, and go to a bank so you know the the, the businesses have to basically live and operate where the customers are living and operating. John, did you want to add to this? Yeah, I guess um, we're in the business at WP of helping our clients with predominantly marketing and branding type problems, which our clients ultimately are looking to drive sales and increase market cap. But that, for us, that means we have to invest ahead of that. You look at where the industry is going. We had a report out last week that 77 cents of every new media dollar is now going to digital. That means we need to be ahead of the curve to cope with that. And so it means we look at acquisitions and investments and partnerships and things that have no revenue behind them just yet. But we have to be willing to take that risk and believe in them and see where they're going. We have a great partnership with Snap because of that very reason. Their business model, who knows where it's going to head, but you know, companies want to spend time on it. Uh, consumers, millennials in particular, want to spend time on it. So we need to be there too. No. Um, we have about five minutes left, and I just wanted to ask something that, um, to, to um, go off of something Manik said about ma um, uh, making sure of uh, employee satisfaction. And that is, in order to attract the best and the brightest, what, how are you going to differentiate your corporation from others, and a lot of times that involves the workplace environment. So. Does management style and workplace atmosphere need to change to foster growth? Um, I'm talking about horizontal versus hierarchical management style. Can ideas come from anyone versus going up a chain of command? Um, Cross-pollinization between departments versus siloed departments? Teamwork or work-life balance for employees, such as maternity leave or on-site gym or um, you know, devoting a percentage of time to pursuing an interest, like the way Google did. Are you guys starting to think about that kind of environment for your companies, if you haven't already? Yeah. So, I mean, so, I, I, can, I can maybe yeah, just kick this off. At least within our company, we take this very, very seriously. And every year across APJ, we participate in the best place to work um, survey. And uh, this year, we were, I think, number six in APJ. Um, across all the companies which were participant to the survey as a best place to work. Now, what goes into this survey is exactly a combination of all these factors, like, for example, you know, do you have the right work-life balance? Do you have enough employee engagement programs? You know, do you, what are your benefits to, um, you know, expecting mothers, uh, maternity leaves, um, gender equality, diversity in the workplace? All, uh, there's a whole bunch of factors which kind of go into it. Uh, which kind of you know facilitate uh, you know that that uh, that that uh, message that it is a good place to work. On top of that, I think it's really a management responsibility to remove the hurdles in terms of anything that could potentially come up from the ground up and listen to the ground. Yeah. It's not really about the hierarchy, but how fast can you move the information around and and really make good ideas to work within the companies. I have to say, to be quite honest, that you know it's it's a part of a huge change, cultural change that needs to happen because um, you know a lot of this is actually learned from the startup world, so it's not so easy. 
Um, and and is, in fact, today in the workplace, if you look at, across the end-to-end -end workplace, we have about four to five generations of workers in the same workplace. So they are very different management style, mentalities, and so on. And we need to manage that. So it's a, it's a journey. But of course, you know, we, we are trying our best to kind of get on top of it. And of course, this is very important. Because, because a good idea and an innovation idea can come from anywhere. It doesn't have to come from the top. We're almost at time, so I want to so. quickly have everyone jump in and... No, I mean, from, from our perspective, it's the number one priority, uh, get, getting the culture right. Because uh, you can have a Madonna come in as a tech guy, but doesn't fit with the culture of the team, and actually it's counterproductive. So, you know, obviously you need the right skill sets, right mindsets, right culture to really foster the kind of innovation and acceptance of ideas and nurturing of ideas that's required. So from us, it's all flat. Um, we got rid of offices, our, our HR is deja. So yeah, absolutely, culture is number one. Tomas? Same thing for us because we believe in the end that you can be best only if you have the best people and best talent. Right now, the the race and competition is even more fierce uh, to get the best people. Uh, especially if you take it in the perspective that according to even uh, local government studies in the next uh, 20 to 30 years, high percentage of uh, uh, jobs will be uh, substituted by the automation. So you need to make sure that this what we're going to, uh, the change of the attribution of the job to the automation versus the, what is done right now manually will create a lot of time and opportunities, opportunities to create a value. So that's why we need to have the smartest people inside the organization to create this value and take the use of the technology. So that's why the culture in terms of open, uh, open culture in the company, open innovation, uh, having all the benefits and uh, uh, giving ability to grow and pursue personal interests uh, within the team and the company, it's, it's, it's uh, on top of our agenda because, as I said, you can't be successful without having the, the, the right people in place. And John? Yeah, I guess just to echo the guys' comments here, unfortunately we don't get free lunch. I get jealous every time I go to the Google office in Singapore. But we, the real thing that we make a push for is entrepreneurship, I think, within, within, our, um, within our teams to make sure people feel valued and uh -huh. uh, real feel ownership towards what they're doing. Okay. Um, that's about our time. Thank you so much for coming. Stay around for Startup Battle Finale. Don't want to miss that. And have a good night. Thank you. That was a great panel. Let's give them a round of applause.